You've heard of love potion number nine. Well, this is life potion number seven. Good morning. Welcome to the Aliyah today. We're going to be talking again about uh, the issues regarding uh, speech, uh, what we say, how important it is. We're going to continue this conversation and looking at a parable uh, story, parable that is given about the potion of life and uh, how important uh, is that? Well, critically important, of course, as we look at how to protect our our life literally uh, from harm and our soul from harm, all by guarding what we say. Yesterday, we spoke at length about uh, watching our mouth. And today, we're going to be continuing that uh, concept. Uh, and why not? Because it's so important. Uh, all of us, I think, walked away from yesterday's teaching, uh, realizing uh, just how important it is to watch our words, watch our mouth. We can't afford uh, anything else uh, to to, to uh, disregard it. It's a incredibly important <laughs> mitzvah, and it's the one that most people don't think anything about. Uh, you know, they, yeah, they just don't. A lot of people just don't give it any any concern whatsoever. What we say, what we do, and we have to be oh so careful uh, judging people, uh, telling people's business. Uh, it's just so important that we watch what we say, and. You know, again, making judgments, by the way, uh, that just popped into my head. This is something else. Just another aspect that people don't think about it. Um, I, <clears throat> through my life, I've realized it, um, that the the concept of, of, of speculation, how many of you know that, uh, um, you know, oftentimes we speculate, okay? And I really dislike uh, speculating, uh, because I, I have found in my <clears throat> my life that uh, speculation is often wrong. Um, you know, we we speculate, and uh, you know, we don't have all the fa all the facts, and as a result, our speculation is way off. And what happens with most of us is that we uh, we make speculations. Oh, I bet you they did this because of that. Uh, I bet you that they didn't say hi to me this morning because they are mad at me or they hate me or they really don't like me. I bet you this happened because of this. And of course, that, that's not true. And we end up assuming that our speculation is correct. We end up making harsh judgments. Um, and then we are just end up being unhappy. And, and, you know, and not just that, it's more than just being unhappy, but we can actually um, uh, end up ruining relationships, distancing ourselves from a community even based on those kinds of uh, speculations. Are you, do you agree with me on that? Have you ever seen that happen uh, in, in your life? Has anybody ever, has anybody ever, anybody, let me put it this way. Has anybody ever gotten mad at you or distanced themselves from you based on some type of speculative thought? Okay, so the point there is, is that, again, we're not partaking of the potion of life because we are, um, uh, you know, we're making judgments. Those those are judgments. That That's Lashon Hara, ultimately. Think about it. So anyway, uh, hope you hope you're doing well this morning and being blessed and full of life. Uh, we are going to dive into this topic, and uh, Hashem is going to help us, Bezrat Hashem, uh, to watch our words and watch our minds and watch our hearts and avoid speculation. Amen. Amen. Let me take a sip of coffee here. All right, so. Um, we're going to look at saying hello to everybody now. So good morning, Hepzibah. Hope you're doing fantastic. Good morning, Kristen. Kristen, hey, Kristen, uh, my apologies for misinterpreting uh, your name yesterday, sir. I apologize for that. I hope you and your wife, Michelle, are doing fantastic. Love the French name, by the way. Uh, respect to all the French <laughs> out there. Uh, good morning, Peaches, formerly from Georgia. I hope you're doing fantastic. Good morning, Gianna. Hope you're doing great there in North Carolina. Can't wait to see you back here again. Nellie Grace, good morning to you. Uh, who else do we have? Leah, good morning to you and Shmuel and all the fam. Very much looking forward to seeing you guys uh, this uh, weekend. 
Chris Crystal, hope you're doing fantastic. And uh, big old Haas. Hey, Haas, how's it going there? Hope you're doing fantastic. Isaac, good morning. Ariella Bokartov. Zaken uh, Yigal, hope you're doing fantastic. Uh, Shoshana Keith and Yaakov Keith uh, fighting the good fight of faith, pushing back the frontiers of ignorance in the Indian territory. Hope you're doing great there. Marita. Uh, soon to be here. Yes, you're coming soon. Looking for that. Soon and very soon. Okay, good morning, Lori. Hope you're doing fantastic. Has um, all her coffee ready. <laughs> coffee ready. Good morning, Kelly. Hope you're doing great. Uh, oh, no, Kelly. You didn't miss the live. Behold, I am here live. So glad you're here. Good morning, Lola. Good morning, Lola. Top of the morning to you. Hope you're doing great. Uh, good morning to, who else do we have? Brenda Jones. Good morning, Brenda. And Sergio, hope you are doing great. Give your love to the family. Say hello to Johnny for me. And uh, who else? Y Yishai and Adaya. Good morning to you. I can't wait to see you guys. It's um, Y'all should live here. <laughs> so Yishai, Adaya, looking very much forward to uh, seeing you guys. And there's Hector watching from West Virginia. Good morning, Hector. Good morning, Lynn Whitaker. Beautiful day in sunny California. I bet it is. California is a beautiful place. Um, spend a lot of my life there. Good morning, Willie Murphy. Hope you're doing great. Mm -hmm. And Sarah Merritt. Good morning, Sarah. Uh, good morning, Milka. Good morning again to you, Katura. Uh, Z Ray. Look, Zaken Rayford is uh, is on the chat today. Zay can Rayford, I have a, a picture of Hadassah I need to send you. I'll do that later. Good morning, Lantern Lights. Hope you're doing great. And good morning to uh, who else do we have? Uh, did I miss somebody? Carol Dancer. Is there a Carol in the house? Somebody said good morning to a Carol and welcome to a Carol. So I feel like I missed somebody. Carol, did I miss you? I'm sorry if I did. My apologies for that. Um, who else do we have? Uh, Kim, Kim Bement from Michigan. Bement. Kim, this is your first time on the chat? If it is, welcome to you. I hope you're doing great. Uh, watching from the great state of Michigan. That's, uh, that's great. Glad you're here. Um, I think I've, I think I've uh, said hello to R Ramona. No, no, I've almost forgot Ramona. Ramona Turner. Good morning to you, Ramona. And Leah, uh, Leah from, uh, Florida. I just, my mind, mind went blank for another. Haniel Yosef. Good morning to you, Haniel. Hope you're doing fantastic. And uh, there's NB. Good morning to you, NB. I don't know what, what your name is there, NB, but I'm glad you were here. Malik Arif. Look at all these people. Man, this is great. Oh, uh, Leah said uh, that Carol Dancer might have deleted her comment. Okay, yeah, I didn't see it. Um. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, glad you're here. Hope life is treating everybody well and being blessed. All right. So we're going to dive into this um, topic here this morning. Let's look at this. Going back to Ma'am Loez, we let where we left off yesterday. It says, "One who speaks maliciously is very much like one who denies God." Okay. Now that's what we were, that's pretty much where we left off yesterday. Um, malicious speech is like one who denies God. Again, we're going to see where this type of uh, situation with our mouth is extremely um, problematic and something we, we, with, we need to be handled with great care. Okay. One should not be surprised at the teachings of our sages that one who speaks maliciously is stricken with leprosy, okay? It is true that we see many people who speak maliciously <clears throat> and who remain healthy and whole without any mark on their skin. However, one must realize that the leprosy mentioned in the Torah can afflict either the body or the soul if it does not strike a person's body, it will strike his soul. So again, we talked about that yesterday, that uh, you know, we, we see people speaking the Shan Hara. Uh, we might say to ourselves, well, if they're speaking the Shan Hara, then how come they don't have anxiety? I mean, what, what's the problem here? 
Well, it's we have to understand, and this is something for all of us to remember, that just because we don't see any physical manifestations of um, uh, of anything doesn't mean that the malady is not there. Okay. And 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 by the way, th it just something a thought that just popped in my mind again. This is one of the tricks of the Satan with Hava. So in the Garden of Eden, uh, gone again. Um, Hava tells the serpent that if we touch the fruit, we will die. Okay. Well, that's because, as the sages have said, there's a couple of thoughts on that. The one being is that Adam had told his wife, don't even touch it. It was, it was the first fence law. Because if, if, you, if you're not going to touch it, then surely you're not going to eat it. And the, 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 the thought is, is that Hava misinterpreted that to mean that this was the word of God. So in other words, God said, don't touch it. But in this case, it was more like a rabbinic fence law. And as a result, the Satan was able to trick her. And when he, he pushed Hava into, the, um, um, into the, the tree, and when she touched the fruit, nothing happened to her. And so he said, see, you touched it and you didn't die. And then through that, he gaslighted her and, and, and convinced her that since, since she touched it and didn't die, then surely she could eat it and not die. And indeed, she ate of it. And guess what? She didn't die. And so the Satan said, see, I told you, you know, it was all a lie. Hashem was lying to you. Okay. By the way, isn't that interesting that the Satan was the first one to say to man that God's laws are burdensome, that he, 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 he gave them to you just to be restrictive and mean, and they have no real power to save your life. Boy, wait, golly, I've heard that somewhere before that see, if you, if you break the law, it's not going to be a problem because it's just burdensome anyway. And his laws are meaningless. Where have I heard that before? Where have I heard that the laws of God are are to be ignored and they're irrelevant because they don't they don't really have any value? Where have I? There's some letters I've read. Oh, I must be thinking something else. I'm sorry. Anyway, going back to our story. So she didn't die right away, and then she, of course she got her husband to, to eat, and guess what? He didn't die either. So what does this teach us? It teaches us that the consequences of our sins may not be instantaneous. But then again, think about it. If they were, as the sages say, if the consequences were sin of sin were instantaneous and obvious, then it would eradicate free will. So in other words, we may be sinning and damaging our soul and we're thinking, oh, I'm, this is fine. Nothing happened to me. See, I speak Lashon Hara all the time and, and my life is good. Is it? See, we can't necessarily see the spiritual or sometimes physical disease that may be manifesting in our, in our body, in our soul. So you see. Uh, good morning, Matthew. I hope you're doing great and, and being blessed. So, and, and Denise, good morning to you as well. So it says here, um, spiritual leprosy is even worse than physical leprosy. Every night when the soul ascends on high, all the spiritual beings are repelled by it and announced before the soul that it is unclean. As the Torah says, he shall call out unclean, unclean. We talked about that yesterday as well. If a person does not repent while he's still alive, when he dies, his soul is not allowed to enter the camp of the righteous. All of them flee and separate themselves from him. Now, one can imagine how much grief the soul suffers when it is when it is uh, disheveled from one place to another and where no one wants to stand next to it. Now, it goes on to say, in the first of all, we can't even fathom how uh, absolutely terrible that must be, right? So if a person, or excuse me, it says in the fourth chamber discussed in the portion of Breshit chapter 6, it is called quicksand, okay? In this chamber, there is a special place called the leprous curse. So again, this is talking about people who 
uh, don't repent of malicious speech, that they're, they live their life um, speaking Lashon Hara. They're purveyors of Lashon Hara. They don't repent of Lashon Hara. Okay. And clearly, by the way, there are people who speak Lashon Hara. All of us, all of us are guilty of the sin. Hashem should help us to make teshuva. But then you and I also know there are people who it's almost like they make their living speaking Lashon Hara. I don't mean that necessarily, literally. But it's almost like there, you, you and I both know people who, um, who, I mean, they're just Lashon Hara people. This is, you know, I, I, I'd have to say that this is really who this is talking about. Uh, nevertheless, we should all guard our speech clearly. Good morning, Nakab. So it says here, this place that this soul is cast is called quicksand. Oh, man, that just sounds terrible. In this chapter, there's a special place called the leper's curse. It is here that the souls of those who speak malicious, maliciously are kept and they suffer immensely. Um, just as a side note, I've, I've heard lots of people, uh, mostly non-Jews, claim that there is no such thing as hell in Judaism. Uh, I don't have time to get into that, uh, where that comes from, aside to say that it actually comes from an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is the same place where the sacred name movement comes from. The sacred name movement is not rooted naturally in Judaism or Torah or anything biblical. It's actually rooted in a cult offshoot of the Seventh-day uh, Seventh Adventist Church, which sprang up in the 1930s. But you can do the history on that. But in that same movement, they started to say there's no such thing as hell and all this kind of stuff. It's just, it's just nutty. But I wanted to say all that to say that in Judaism, um, there's absolutely the concept of hell. There are actually seven levels of hell, just like there are seven levels of heaven. Hell is uh, sometimes called hell in, Judea in Jewish literature, but more often than not, it's referred to as Gehenna. And uh, some people suffer there for a temporary some people suffer there forever, okay? And uh, I just wanted to point that out in case you guys, because, you know, the internet is full of uh, just, it's terrible. Well, you, you know, the internet's not exactly the place to learn. Um, but if you're out there and you come across that, you should just know it's not true, okay? And there are many, many sources in Judaism that talk about Gehenna and the levels of Gehenna and and so on and so forth. And here, what I'm just reading to you right now, Ma'am Loez is talking about that that soul who refused to repent of their malicious talk, the Lashon Hara, um, is, uh, let's see, somebody just wrote, there is a hell, but it's not for people, it's for Hasatan and his angels. See, that's not, that's not true. Uh, I'm not sure who MJ515 is, but that's what I'm talking about. Like somebody just said, yeah, there is a hell, but it's only for Satan and the angels. No, it's not. Um, that's not true. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. That, that person uh, probably heard that somewhere and uh, believed that to be true, and that's fine. So I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're hearing that it's, in fact, not true. As I've just read, uh, human souls have gone to and will go to, God forbid, Gehenna, if they don't make the Shuva. And how do we know this to be true, aside from the fact that we find it in, in, spirit, in, 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 in literature, uh, rabbinic literature from antiquity? How do we, how do we know this to be true? Well, because... It says so in the Gospels. <laughs> I mean, Yeshua himself said it, right? So, therefore, it's a fact. All right, so through this, we can understand the following story that is related in the Midrash. There was a peddler. Like, so, so now we get to our potion of life story. L life potion number seven. Here it is. Through this, we can understand the following story that is related in the Midrash. Okay. <clears throat> There was once a peddler who went from city to city and announced, who wants a life potion? Who wants to buy a potion of life? Now, he came to Rabbi uh, Yanai, who was in the house, and called to him through the window. Come on into my house, said the rabbi. I would like to try some of your potion. Now, this potion is not for you, said the peddler, and it is not for those like you. Now, Rabbi Yanai urged him to come into the house, and he said, where is this potion of life that you're selling, asked the rabbi. The peddler took a book of psalms from his pocket 
and showed him the 34th Psalm, where it is written, who is the man who desires life, who loves days to see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking maliciously. Psalm 34, verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> the scripture was saying that one who wants life must bridle his mouth and not speak maliciously. So in this case, the potion of life is the scriptures, the word of God, okay? All my life, said Rabbi Yanai, I never understood exactly what that verse meant. Now this peddler has told me, I, and now I understand. This is also what King Solomon said. He who watches his mouth and his tongue will keep his soul from grief. Proverbs 21, 23. Notice what King Solomon said. Watching our words, watching our tongue will keep our, what? Soul from grief. Now, this indicates that one who watches his mouth and does not speak maliciously will safeguard his soul against the leprous curse. This is the account cited in the Midrash. One may wonder, <clears throat> what was the great wisdom of the peddler? Rabbi Yanai said that without him, he would not have understood the biblical verse. The words that the peddler said were actually simple, literal. The literal meaning being that we have to guard what we say every day. <clears throat> now, one might ask, what's the difficulty in that verse that Rabbi Yanai could not understand it without the peddler? However, according to what we have said, this can be understand quite, understood quite well. <clears throat> Pardon me. Rabbi Yanai knew that the Torah teaches that everyone who speaks maliciously is stricken with leprosy. However, we see that many people who do speak maliciously and nothing happens to them. Furthermore, why does the Torah double its wording and say, who is the man who desires life, who loves days to see good? Now, the peddler came and said, who wants a potion of life? He was asking, who wants to be healthy in body and soul so that neither should be stricken with leprosy? After all, a leper is considered like the dead. Now, when Rabbi Yanai understood that the soul can be stricken with leprosy, just like the body, all his questions were answered. Therefore, he said, now I understand the words of King Solomon, who said, he who watches his mouth and keeps his, his soul from grief in Proverbs 21, 23. The word for grief is zaroth, which sounds very much like zarat, meaning leprosy. The verse can be thus interpreted. He who watches his mouth and tongue safeguards his soul from leprosy. Since the scripture is speaking of the soul, we see that the soul can be afflicted by leprosy just as the body can be. So this was the question of the rabbi. He said, you know, how come we see people speaking Lashon Hara and we don't see them as lepers or, or people who are afflicted with Zarat? And the answer is, is that they are, we just can't see it. It's on their soul. And I'm going to, I'm going to post this, that this is why and this has been my experience is it's it's not scientific it's it's um you know it's it's just my experience but people who are gossipers and speak lashon hara and tell bearers you'll notice that they don't have many friends they're they're usually people who are you know generally alone they again they might have a couple of friends or a few friends but they don't have many friends and uh, I believe I'm going to I'm going to tell you that I think that's because they they have a spiritual leprosy on their soul and people intrinsically and instinctively just don't want to be around them. I, I, I believe that to be true. Baruch Hashem. Do you, do you have you have any of you have the same experience or do, have you noticed the same thing? We all know people who are gossipers and so forth. Yeah, I think so. Hector's right. Imagine that the Torah brings life. Yeah, Hector, it, it's true. By the way, uh, Tamara uh, Gigaro, Gigaro uh, I hope I pronounced your name properly. Apologize if I mispronounced. Good morning to you, Tamara, and welcome to the program. I think, is this your first time to be here, Tamara? Um, if so, welcome. Yeah, Kristan. Um, yeah, she, you, you know, Haniel, Ramona. Uh, yeah, y'all have all experienced this too. 
I, I think that, that we just kind of, we get around these people and our soul just says, there's something wrong. This, this is an unclean person, you know? And, and look, all of this is about, we're, we're talking about these topics, but obviously we all need to be looking in the mirror and say, man, I, I don't let this be me. Don't be speculative. You know, we, I started out talking about speculation and I, I've seen in my life, lifetime that that is a big, big mistake we make. We have to um, not be, not uh, make a speculation. You know, this goes, speculation to me is, is part and parcel with um, making uh, false judgments or harsh judgments or not judging favorably. And in, in, in Jewish literature, the example that was given one time that I read uh, long, many years ago was suppose you're driving, driving down the road and you see a Jew walking out of McDonald's. Well, a malicious mind, a malicious soul would speculate, would make a harsh judgment and say, you know what? I bet you, I can't believe they went in there and had a, had a, a Big Mac. You know, look at them. They're not even eating kosher. But the uh, literature I was reading said, we shouldn't think that way. We should think, say to ourselves, <clears throat> I bet you that that person was having a, a little minor emergency and uh, they really needed to use the restroom. And the only place they could, they had available at the moment was McDonald's. So they ran in there and used the restroom. You see, you see the difference? You know, we shouldn't assume that such a person would go there to eat, but they, they went there because they needed to use the facilities. You see what I'm saying? Uh, and that's speculation uh, can get us into a lot of trouble. Um, and I've seen this happen so many times. I know you have too. It's just that this is why, well, this is another topic, but this is why open communication is so helpful. So you, something happened and you said, man, I don't know why that person said that to me. Uh, and so in your mind, the Satan can say, you know, the reason they said that to you is because they don't like you. They disrespect you. They're, they're blah, blah, blah. And what you don't know is that there's, that's not it at all. There's, there's a whole thing. Maybe you misinterpreted. Maybe they came across the wrong way because they were, their mind was on something else. And this is why if you just go to the person and say, you know, the other day I asked you this question and you kind of snapped back at me. Um, I don't really understand why that happened. And the person, you know, to your shock and amazement, the person would be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh no, you said this. And I said, and they would say, Oh no, that's not what I meant at all. Uh, no, 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 no. I was, I was thinking over here about this and you said that and I thought you meant this. And the two of you can go, oh, okay. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no. Big, big misunderstanding. You see how simple that was? But I've seen people who will leave the community because they didn't do that. That is nothing more than the Satan of God and in. How many of you agree with me? How many of you agree you've seen stuff like that? People that know they're no longer like... Where, where'd so-and-so go? Where'd they go? And you talk to them. Well, blah, 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 blah. Well, did you go talk to anybody? No. Oh, you see what I'm saying? Don't do that. That And that's malicious. What I'm trying to say also, I'm trying to tie this back to that in and of itself is malicious speech. Because when we do that, we're making a harsh judgment against somebody. And we're not taking the time to go find out whether or not that judgment is true. And it doesn't affect them, but that leprosy now clings to our soul. You see how bad it is? I hope you do. So it says, um, <clears throat> let's continue reading. Uh, where do I leave off? Portion of life. Okay, here. When Rabbi Yane understood the soul can be stricken, he said, now, now I understand. The scripture speaks about spiritual leprosy rather than physical leprosy because the spiritual leprosy is much worse than the physical variety as we have seen earlier. Furthermore, if the soul is defiled by leprosy, a person's prayers are not accepted until he is humbled and repent. Oh my goodness. So now we've entered in another problem. Who, who, who of us needs our prayers hindered? And boy, I've seen this. People speak Lashon Hara, and then their life, and this, things just don't go well. So it says, the Torah, therefore, says, one on, on the day of his purification, he shall be brought to the priest, 14.2. This means that on the day that a person is purified from the sin of malicious speech and repents, 
He can then be brought to the priest where the word priest alludes to God. This indicates that his prayers are accepted. The remedy for speaking maliciously is to struggle to understand the Torah after one repents. Okay, The Torah therefore say, uh, says, this is the Torah of the leper on the day of purification. This indicates that the remedy for the leper on the day that he wishes to be purified to purify himself is the Torah. The Torah, ladies and gentlemen, is the remedy for anything. Why is it the remedy for sin? Because Torah is the opposite of sin. To sin is to break the Torah, to not follow the laws of Moses. Why do you think the Satan, uh, once again, I'm going to say this. Why do you think, think about who the Satan is. Okay, y'all, are y'all tracking with me so far? Think in your mind who the Satan is, what does he represent? Now, why would the Satan raise up a man who would write a series of letters and then the Satan would subsequently convince people that those letters are the word of a God when those letters, whatever you think about the person who wrote them, okay, what I'm about to say, you have to agree with because it's true. Because of that person's letters, as a result of those letters, no one today who believes in the Messiah, JC, follows the law of Moses. Do, can, can, you, can we at least agree with that? Can we at least agree? If, if, and again, I'm talking to rational people who live in Realville, of, of which I'm the mayor. Can you agree with me that because of that man's letters, as a result of those writings and those writings alone, no one follows the law of Moses today? All right, now I persist that it's the Satan who raised up that person to write those letters. 100% believe that. After 30 long years of study, that has, is my conclusion. Not just study. I should just not say study. 30 years of study and practice. Okay? Why? Okay. Why would the Satan want to do that? Because Torah is the opposite of sin. Indeed, to sin is to violate the Torah. Would it make sense that the father of lies would want to keep people in a world and a lifestyle of sin? Does that sound at least plausible? Does it? I think yes. I think it's plausible that the Satan would very much like to make sure that people continue eating the forbidden fruit. Because as long as they continue to eat the forbidden fruit, they continue to remain under his dominion, which was the whole point. If you read all the stories in rabbinic literature about the fall of Satan, which which the most of those wonderful stories come from the, 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 the legends of the Jews, which compiles all the Midrashim and so forth. You find out that this was this was the Satan's motive. He wanted man to be subjected to him. And the way to get man to be subjected to him was to make sure that man did not follow the law of God, otherwise known as the Torah. So therefore, when we are struggling with sin, the remedy for that struggle is to dive into Torah. Why? Because Torah is the opposite of sin, which is the opposite of Satan's kingdom. This is why the Torah is the covenant. Because the Torah is the kingdom. That this is why Torah is referred to in the Sephiroth as Malchut, the crown, the kingship. Because if you have the Torah, you have the crown of priesthood, the sages say, and you have the, the crown of kingship. If you have the Torah. But if you abandon the Torah, which the Satan raised up a man to write letters to make sure you did, then you would no longer be in God's kingdom, but you'd be in the Satan's kingdom because he is the king of Torahlessness. He's the king of lawlessness. This is the issue. This is the, this is the issue. The reason that I have spent time directly attacking and confronting the heretic letter writer 
is specifically because it is his writings and his writings alone that prevent people from following the law of Moses. No one, when I talk about the law of Moses, no one ever says, okay, I hear what you say, Rabbi, but, 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 but JC said, or I hear what you say, Rabbi, but Ezekiel said, I, Rabbi, I understand your point, but, but, but Jeremiah said, no one ever says that. It's always, but Paul said. So somebody wrote into the channel um, recently and said, you know, just leave Paul alone and let God take care of it. No, I'm not going to leave him alone. I, I bet you would like me to do that. Please stop. It's kind of like, it's kind of like Hamas. Uh, ceasefire, ceasefire. Uh, please stop shooting at us, uh, you know, uh, for your own benefit. <laughs> I bet you would like us to stop shooting at you. I bet very much you would like for us to stop stop sending missiles and so forth your way. I bet you very much you would like for us to... Can we have a timeout here? Cease fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, the, the, fi the fire will cease when you surrender. Okay? <laughs> That's a ceasefire. The ceasefire is you're unconditional surrender that's the ceasefire right okay in the spirit realm that's our ceasefire we'll stop firing when you surrender okay but until then we're not going to do it why because we're in a spiritual battle here and and it's it's important because we're fighting for souls and so no we're not going to stop talking about him yeah I'm, we're not going to start stop destroying falsehood just so that people can feel comfortable? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, you may disagree with me on that, but, uh, I don't know what to say. I, I just, we're going to keep, keep going on. So the remedy is Torah. Okay. It says, this is the meaning of the verse. A healing of the tongue is the tree of life. Proverbs 14, five. So we see now the healing tongue is a tree of life. We have to speak words of life, judge favorably. None of this is easy, by the way. This is the most diff everything I've been talking about for the last two days is the most difficult mitzvah to keep. This means that the remedy for malicious speech, it says, is the Torah. Why? Because Torah is the word of life. Everything depends on the tongue. This 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 statement of everything depends on the tongue comes from another commentator named Rebenu Bakya. Everything depends on the tongue, and he and he writes, and I conclude with this today. Evil gossip is a greater sin than even murder, idolatry, or indulging in one's carnal, carnal, fleshly instincts indiscriminately. And we can find this proof in Genesis 4.13. Rebbein Yubakia says, and this is just a reminder, that everything depends on the tongue. And if we speak Lashon Hara, it's as if. We learned yesterday, it's like you've just violated all five books of the, of the Torah. Well, now... He says, in fact, it's like you've committed idolatry and murder and sexual sin all because we didn't guard our tongue. We have to watch our mouth and we need the potion of life. May Hashem help us to do just that. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being here. It is a blessing to be with you. Let's continue to get the comments out of our homes and of our out of our souls. If you like these programs, please be sure and, and donate to Lapid Judaism. We need your financial support. It's a great time to do that. If you're part of the Lapid Nation, everybody's going to be a tither. All, every single one of us tithing. I believe if we do that, then Hashem is going to release an anointed blessing upon us individually and also corporately. So thank you for being here. Please like this video, share with all your friends, comment on it. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, have a great and amazing day. Shalom Aleichem.